Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. The Flames are back home and the Briars left town as the seven-game road trip comes to an end. As usual, Dan and Matt here with you. How you doing, buddy? Good. So it's been a long road trip. Um, Flames did better on the road trip than I thought they were going to do. We had a 4-2-1 and one record. How'd you think they were going to end up on this long trip? I was not expecting as good of a trip that, as they had. A lot of the buildings that the Flames ventured into were not exactly friendly places in recent Flames history. I know we've struggled usually in Boston and uh, Philadelphia, and yet we were able to come away with two points in each. Now we just need to eventually get the win in Anaheim, and we've conquered all the demon arenas. Yeah. If they don't win in Anaheim next season, then they will actually be tied for the NHL record for the longest futility streak in an opponent's arena. Wow. Um, so going back to what we talked about um, before on the show is breaking down the series into seven or the season into seven game series. We just actually concluded one of those seven game series. Um, and the series started in February on the 18th when the Flames took on Minnesota. And it ended on the Boston game on the 5th. And unfortunately, this is another, uh, this is the second series of the season that the Flames lost. They lost that seven game stretch four to three. And if it was a playoff series, it would have been a five game series with four and one for, or one and four would have been our playoff series. So four, four losses, one win in that time. And that would have been a five game series and we're out. So that puts the Flames at seven and two for series wins so far this year, which if you think about the last time they lost a series was that terrible stretch during December, they're doing pretty darn good. Yeah. And with the competition that the Flames faced in the last half of February and the beginning of March, the fact that they went four and three in the seven game series to me is a success just because of the fact they were playing so many good teams. For sure. And, you know, even on the road when they were playing good teams and they lost, all three of their losses were only one goal losses, which, you know, even if you're going to lose to some of those teams, if you can be in it down to the last goal, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, like the Rangers game, it was a one nothing shutout. The Islanders game was a 2-1 loss with two goals being scored in the last minute. And the overtime shootout loss to Ottawa. Well, let's talk about that Ottawa game. So, I mean, the, the Ottawa game and even the Detroit game. I mean, I we saw, I think, probably two of the best comebacks, if not the best two comebacks, of the Flames' whole season. I was sitting watching the Detroit game with a friend of mine, and when Abdelkader put us down two goals early on, I thought, wow, this is going to be a long night for the Flames. But to be able to climb back in both those games, I mean, even Ottawa, when we were down by four goals to come back, you got to give these guys a lot of credit for being able to maintain their, uh, you know, their poise, being not getting frustrated, being able to play the game after that. And I would love to be a fly in the wall in the dressing room to see exactly what Hartley's been saying to to warm these guys up. Yeah, anytime you have a team that is as resilient as the Flames, that will be paying dividends in the years to come, and. Learning the ability to never say die, even if you're down 4 nothing, going down and into the third period. And the Flames got a single goal by Colborne, and you could see the game turned on its head right then and there. And you could almost feel it in the building that everybody was going, oh, they're going to come back. And of course the Flames did manage to force it to overtime. And... That's a good thing because in playoff series, not only this year if the Flames make the playoffs, but in years moving forward, it'll be hard to put this team away in a playoff series. Yeah, I didn't think of it that way, but I guess you're right. Even, yeah, if we're down and even if it takes a, you know, a late tie and take it to a long overtime, yeah, if you can show that you can come back from, you know, a 4 four nothing deficit, even if you take it to overtime and lose to show that you can get four goals as quickly as the Flames did, you're right. It's going to make it tough to uh, 
to get the Flames out. And I think no matter who we play, if we do go to the playoffs, we're going to really make it hard on them. Yeah. that The Ottawa game reminded me of Game 6 against Vancouver back in 2004 because the Flames went down 4 nothing in that game and managed to crawl all the way back before losing in triple overtime. So it's just good to see that kind of heart in the team. And, you know, I think one of the things that I thought was special about the Ottawa game, too, is that we saw two of our goals from Chris Russell on the point. And, you know, maybe that's one of the big topics of the week that, you know, we need to address is how the Flames are doing post-Giordano because it seems like everyone on the blue line has really stepped up their game to fill that role. Yeah, and even more important than the play of Russell and Weidman, I think that Derek England has elevated his game so much this past week, getting from going from being the 5-6 guy to being alongside TJ Brody for 20 plus minutes and not skipping a beat. Yeah, and I, you know, of all defensemen, I mean, I think England has probably got the worst rep this year. He came in with a lot of people upset about the contract and arguably hasn't played up to his potential this year, but I agree with you. He's been given an opportunity, and as we've seen so often this season with, you know, all the Flames players, he's relished that opportunity and made himself better. And to me, I guess the question is, does he stay playing at this level next season when Gio's back? Or does he slip back into the Derek England that we've seen all year? I don't know. But the fact that the Flames can rely on him more than being a a 12-minute-a-night guy, that will help to, like, once Giordano is back next season, to spread things out a little better so that way... Because, like, all season, the Flames have pretty much relied on the top four of Gio, Brody, Weidman, and Russell to carry the play and, you know, not really playing the third pairing much at all. So if England can keep this up for the rest of the season, perhaps you can rely on him being a a 15-minute-a-night guy without being overly concerned that, you know, he's going to be a liability out there. Yeah, No, for sure. And, you know, as much as he, and I think a lot of it probably has to do with the fact that he's been playing primarily with Brody. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think Brody, we've seen Brody do so well this year. And I think that if he was perhaps playing with somebody else, he might not look as good as he is now. Um, And I think a lot of it is probably Brody pushing him to be the best that he can and demanding a different level of play from Derek England. Yeah, TJ Brody is quickly emerging as a, a Scott Niedemeyer clone. Yeah, it he is. seems. I mean, if you were putting if you were putting England out there this week with, you know, um, Schlemko or Diaz or any of those kind of guys, I'm not sure we would have seen the same change in him. Probably not. But Brody is a bona fide number one defenseman. It's just nice that the Flames have two of them. Yeah, I think too, uh, you know, as well as um, we've seen England step up and we we can look back to the Boston game for this guy for sure, but we've really got to see Dave Schlemko come in and make his mark. You know, we saw him win the Boston game, which I wasn't expecting at all. When I saw Schlemko was going out to shoot, I thought, come on, there's got to be another forward somewhere that can do this. Yeah. And he won the game. Oh, I know. And that move that he made was probably the nicest shootout goal that a Calgary Flame has ever scored. Could be. Yeah, I haven't gone back through them all. I think I remember a, a Bertuzzi uh, goal that was pretty nice. Yeah, the one where he one-handed shoveled it yeah. over the guy's pad. But it's just nice to see some artistic creativity in the shootout for coming from the Flames. Usually it's the other team scoring on the Flames goalie. Yeah, so. and nice to see, you know, Schlemko, even outside of that, he looks to me like he fits right in here. You know, we're seeing him playing. I don't even know what he's played for minutes, but I'm seeing him out there. He always seems like he's doing the right things. There hasn't been a play yet where I've gone, wow, Dave Schlemko really screwed things up there. Yeah, well, the thing is, is that in 
both Arizona and Dallas, the fans of those teams couldn't understand why they got rid of Schlemko, and they didn't feel that he was deserving of being placed on waivers. So perhaps the Flames are just lucky to get somebody that's been quietly playing well, but got lost in the sauce and on other teams. Well, and as we've talked about in the past, that's one of the things that we're known for. I mean, you look at guys like Glenn Cross, you even go back as far as guys like, say, Christian Aselius, who perhaps weren't getting the shots they needed. Mika Kiprasov, who's a third string goaltender. We tend to bring those guys in and they tend to do well here. Yeah, well, even look at Chris Russell. He was uh, cast off in both Columbus and St. Louis. The Flames gave him a shot, and look at how well he's played. Yeah. And, you know, I think Schlemko is really, especially on this road trip, shown that he probably, I mean, he was the cheapest rental acquisition at the whole deadline. We got him off waivers. We gave up nothing for him, and his contract's over. But I see no reason not to re-sign him. Oh, no. It, especially if you just keep him as a seventh defenseman, sort of in that uh, Derek Smith spot. Almost the role that we've used Potter in this year. Yeah, or even Diaz. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, because Potter's been up and down to the minors. You can't send, sh- send Slemko down. So, yeah, no, I think you're right. Kind of the Diaz role for sure. Yeah, and in the three games, he played seven minutes, 13 and a half, and 11 and a half. It's not so, bad. yeah, it's better than getting like five minutes a night and not being played at all. Well, speaking of Rafael Diaz, he's another guy whose contract is over at the end of the year. And I have seen Diaz at least lately. And I don't know if maybe it's because he's got more ice time, but he seems to be coming around and he doesn't look like just the, the fill in seventh guy anymore. He's, to me, he's looking like a bona fide five sixer. Yeah. Uh, I like Diaz, but I don't know like if the Flames will have the numbers to keep him. Yeah. Especially having Smead and England both on long-term contracts as the 5-6 guys. Yeah, well, I think if you didn't have Schlemko come in, you'd re-sign Diaz for sure. But I think with Schlemko coming in, being the younger guy of the two, he's two years younger... You probably go with him, and he'll probably be cheaper too. I mean, we know that Diaz was looking for a big contract last summer, didn't get it, and came to camp. And I think after this year, he might be willing to play for you know million, million five somewhere in there. And I bet somebody would pay him that. Oh, probably. He hasn't been bad. Like, it's not slamming Diaz at all. He'd be He's... a good six, seven defenseman on pretty much any team. Yeah, the Flames also have to look at the size of their defense. And having Chris Russell, who's 5'11", and Diaz, who's also 5'11", that's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. And Schlemko's 6'1", so he's not exactly big, but it, you know, it's not as bad. Yeah, no, that's true. So, yeah, I, th- I think that of the two of them, if we have to say goodbye to one of them, it would make more sense to let Diaz walk. Yeah. And that's no slight on him. No. He's been great. He was here on a one-year deal. He, we he served out his one-year deal, and we let him walk. And, you know, if maybe if he's not signed next year, come training camp, you bring him back for a tryout again and say make the team again. But I have a feeling after this year, somebody will probably sign him. I think that he was was having a reputation as being overpaid and under-delivering in the past. And I think now on a $700,000 contract, you can say that he's good value for that money. And I think someone else would look at that and say, yeah, let's give him a shot at that kind of cash. Yeah, he's an NHL defenseman. It's just the Flames have too many as it is right now. So yeah, it's just a numbers game. Talking about guys who look good on the road, um, to me the biggest star of the road trip, if I look up the whole roster, has to be Kerry Ramo. Definitely. And, I mean, we saw him even in a game against, um, you know, and this is one of the great things about having two strong goaltenders. Even in a game like Ottawa, where he gets pulled, we had Hiller go in and play a a great game after him. So, you know, that's one of the benefits we have with having two strong goalies. And we were both kind of surprised, I think, last week at our deadline show that Ramo didn't get moved. We kind of said that it was probably because Ordeo's hurt. But Matt, do you think that after such a great road trip, we could let Rama walk this summer for nothing? Uh, that's really, really tough. 
I don't know. And it depends on how the team evaluates Ortio. Like, I know Ortio's contract is a, a one-way deal, so we're going to be paying him NHL dollars whether he's in the AHL or not. I don't know. I It's really tough. Like, unless the Flames were to trade Hiller at the draft or something... I don't see how you can have three goalies that are all NHL caliber. It's similar to the Diaz-Slemko thing, that there are too many bodies that are NHL caliber talent, and someone's got to go. That's not necessarily saying that it needs to be Ramo, it's just one of the three has to go. Do you, do you think that Yoni Ordeo is re- is ready to come up next year? The problem is is that <sighs> he's going to be a backup and he's only going to play like 10 games. I would almost rather keep him at the A and let him play 60 70 games. Well, the thing is with him is that he's played well enough in the AHL where he likely if it wasn't for the fact the Flames had Hiller and Ramo both playing well. He'd be here already. Uh, Yeah, and he's 23 going 24, if not now, when? And he needs to show whether he's the goalie of the future or not and allow a guy like John Gillies to get signed in the offseason and let him start in the AHL. What do you you think Kerry Rama would want dollars and term-wise in order to re-sign here? Uh, probably another year at the same dollar, give or take. He's played well enough. I don't think he's done well enough to be a four or five million dollar goalie. He's been solid, but... So if we look at our two goalies, right now we're paying Jonas Hiller 4.5 million for this year and two more. And we're paying Kerry Ramo uh, 2.75 million this year, or I guess 2.75 million cap hit. It's a 2.9 million dollar contract, and this is the last year of it. So you you think you'd probably get him for 2.9, maybe three one somewhere in there? Yeah, even three five wouldn't be out of line, but it, it would depend. Like anything. Plus, the problem is that around the NHL, there is not a lot of room for goalies, period. Like, we saw how much of a hard time Brodeur had finding a spot, and there's not really too many jobs out there. I think for a 27-year-old, there's probably more jobs than there is for Martin Brodeur. Sure, but how many? Uh, Like, I think Edmonton might be the only, and Buffalo would be the only teams that could use a starting goaltender and who knows what they're going to do. Yeah. I don't know. I've, I've been thinking about this all week after watching him in the, uh, in the road trip. And I posed this question to our Twitter and Facebook followers too, which if they thought that we can let uh, Ramo walk and a couple people, notably uh, Scott Snowden, who goes by at Scott underscore flames fan tweet us back and said that he actually thinks that Ramo is better than Hiller. And Ramo's the guy to keep around. Um, I can I can see that from Ramo. He's definitely developed this year into a better goalie than he was last year by quite a bit. If I were the GM, I think I'd sign Ramo just so you don't lose him. Sign him as the as the insurance policy. Bring him back, and maybe let him and Hiller fight it out for the starter job in camp and trade one of them. Yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, it's going to be a really tough decision for the management of the Flames. Uh, there's, It's going to be a problem no matter which way that you go with it, and it's not going to be the ideal situation no matter which way you go about it. So it's just tough. Does Hiller have any sort of no movement on his contract? No. Know? No? Okay. No, so, so that makes and it his easier. His contract for you to get along. Expi- yeah, his contract does expire after next season. So hypothetically, the Flames could trade him at the deadline next year if Ortio or Ramo play outplay him. Yeah, and and that's a possibility too. Then I mean, if you look at the age difference on them, Kerry Ramo is twenty seven, um, Jonas Hiller is 
32. So if you think about it age-wise, Ramos probably your goalie that's going to last longer, but he's just starting to get into that age where goalies start to mature well. So yeah, you could see that. You could see them trade um, Hiller at the deadline. Maybe you even see them trade him early in the deadline and absorb part of the salary if they need to just to get him off the books for one year since we'll be able to do that. Yeah, and like I said, uh, both Edmonton and Buffalo could use a starting goalie at the draft, so that might be a feasibility. Yeah. Yeah, I would just hate to let Rama walk and then regret that we did so later because we thought Hiller was the guy. I'd rather sign them both and then deal with it once we've had a chance to figure it out. Yeah. It'll be fun. Something to keep an uh, eye on as we move forward into the off season. And I also think that Jonas Hiller, I mean, he's coming off a couple bad seasons in Anaheim. I think last year was bad. The year before wasn't great. To me, and I, I mean, I've said this before with skaters as well, but prove to me that you can do it. You know, he's had one good year here in Calgary. Is he back to his form as one of the top goalies in the NHL? Or did he just have a great year like the rest of this team? So I think, to me, that is a question mark that I have around Jonas Hiller as well, of show me twice that you can do this, and then we'll talk extension. Yeah, I agree. You know, like, I, I always hate it when guys play well in a contract year, get a contract, and then don't play up to that standard again. So, you know, especially a guy coming off a bad year like that, show me you can do it twice, and then we'll look at you as having rebounded. True. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that goes, but it's, you know... As we've said so many times this season, what a great problem to have. Like, you know, there's been times in the past where we've said, we have a backup goalie who can't save a puck. You know, we've had one goaltender and another body who just occupies the net when Kipper wasn't around. So what a great problem to have. And I imagine Flames management thinks the same thing, of sitting around saying, we have three good goaltenders. What do we do? Yeah. Same thing with the forwards. Oh, we have 15 good forward prospects. What do we do with them all? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you know, for a guy who's coming into his first GM job in um, Tre Living, what, you know, there's a lot of guys, like, look at the Buffalo GM that came in and that sort of thing. They've got tough markets to to try and come into, but what a an easy year, I guess, for Tre Living to step into. It's like all the problems he has are all the problems that other GMs envy. Exactly. Although I don't want him saying that half the teams in the league would trade their roster for ours like some other team up north. <laughs> no, of course not. But, you know, I mean, as as a as a GM who's brand new to this, I think it's probably easier for him to step into this when he doesn't have to put out a bunch of fires in his first year. No, like the Flames have the lowest payroll in the league and the flexibility to spend to the cap. We have a whole host of good forward prospects we got a bunch of good goalie prospects there there's not really much else that you could ask for no and with the team being so successful this year it's not like we've had to ship a bunch of guys out so it's not like he's had to dismantle this team like maybe he thought he was gonna have to true well matt let's uh let's talk about another guy who we saw on this road trip um, outside of the goaltender who played spectacularly, and that was Drew Shore, who got recalled to the Flames, um, played his 70th NHL game, which means that he's now no longer waiver eligible. So Drew Shore is going to stay here for the rest of the year, I imagine. I can't see a scenario where Drew Shore would clear waivers. Can you? No, not at all. And realistically, he's played well enough where he should be a quality bottom six player for the flames drew shores hasn't played a lot here this year he's played five he's played five games zero goals one assist one point and he's minus three so far and i agree with you he's a bottom six uh centerman and i think he's probably turning into what we hoped corbin knight would turn into would you agree with that definitely and he has had some mistakes in the games that he's played but there's enough there where he's deserving of a spot on the team. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, he's a young guy. You know, he's only 24. He doesn't have a lot of NHL experience. He's played 70 games. So I would expect that um, he's going to make mistakes. 
Well, y- you look back to last year, Joel Colborn, when he came into the league, he kind of was not very good for the first 50 or 60 games. And now he's come into his own where if you extrapolate his points over an 82-game season, uh, he would be posting 43 points, which that's pretty good for a third-line player. So there's enough in Shore's game where you can see that he will likely become a solid depth player for the Flames, whether that's not until this time next year is yet to be seen, but he has shown quite a bit of skill and like on the his one assist on the forecheck that was a good play to fight lose the puck get the puck and then find Raymond for the the goal so it's like a lot of the players it's a work in progress yeah well that's what we expect from a rebuilding team right we're expecting this to be a work in progress we're expecting these guys to need the skills and need the development to get those skills better, I should say. If we look back at the original trade, the Flames traded their fourth-round pick in the 2013 NHL entry draft to the Florida Panthers for Corbin Knight, and then traded Corbin Knight one-for-one one for Drew Shore. So, I mean, what you were kind of talking about with Joel Colborn, I think we traded, what, a fifth-round pick for Colborn? No, it was a fourth a as fourth? well. So that kind of makes sense. I mean, if you compare those two, we gave up roughly the same thing. Essentially, we gave up a fourth-round draft pick for Drew Shore. Um, I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Shore develops and do probably a, you know, a third round. At, I think at best, he's going to be your replacement second-round center or second-line center, I should say, when somebody gets hurt. But yeah, definitely probably a third-line center going forward if he keeps on the trajectory he's going. Yeah, and he has the flexibility to be pushed over to the right wing if need be as well. So if next season, say, you have the top three centers being Monaghan, Bennett, and Backlund, you can have Shore on the right wing on the third line instead of being relegated to the fourth line of the press box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I in a team that has as deep a forward... I not really a roster, but as deep a forward kind of farm roster as the Flames do, it's great to see a guy like Drew Shore come in and immediately step into an NHL role. I mean, he's surpassed guys in the depth chart who haven't had as much of a look as he has this season. So it's good to see he's come in and embrace that kind of, I guess, spirit the Flames are trying to get this year, which is make an impression. We'll call you up. Exactly. And with the Flames having so many good prospects, it's not like all of these guys will stick long term, but at least they're showing enough for right now to be relied on as an NHL player like Josh Juris and Shore thus far. And next year, they might not be good enough and you might have to trade one of them. Who knows? But for now, it's a good thing. And like everything, we have to be patient because what happen- what is happening today might not be what will be tomorrow. Yeah, even though Drew Shore is a little bit older, I kind of look at him as perhaps stepping into the Sven Berchi role that's now been opened. It's kind of that bit of a long shot prospect who has great potential. Um, you know, we all thought that Berchi could make the team. He got sent down to Adirondack. Sort of improved, but now he's out of here and off to Vancouver. And I think that Drew Shore could step into that same kind of role of being the young guy who has a lot of potential and might surprise us with how well he can do. Yeah. And a uh, quick Sven Berchi update. He has four points in three games in the AHL since the trade. So. You know, I have nothing against him. If he can figure it out, good for him. Yeah, I like th- I like that he's gone back to number 47, his kind of original Flames number down in Utica as well. Yeah. So, yeah, good for him. I, you know, I want him to be successful, and if he wasn't working out in Calgary, I still see people that are kind of upset that the Flames made the trade, but he didn't want to be here. If he doesn't want to be here, get rid of him. Move him somewhere he wants to be. Yep, and if he can salvage a career out of it good for him if not at least we get a second round pick 
So yeah, as bittersweet as it'll be, I hope that someday he's you know scoring on the Flames as a Canuck because that would mean he's made it. Yeah. Well, I'll be booing him when he comes to Calgary. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I think he'll he'll get that a few times. Yeah, exactly. And I I would like the opportunity to be able to boo him. <laughs> Means that he's doing something worthy of being in the NHL. Yeah, exactly. He's he's in the NHL. He's playing there. Good for him if he's able to get booed here. Um, we should probably also note talking about the great week that the Flames have had and some of these guys that are playing well. The Flames have the first star of the week for the entire league this week with Yari Hoodler, who was named first star of the NHL. And he did have a great week for sure. When I look back at his week, especially on this road trip, I think more than we've seen from him before, he's starting to look like the Yari Hoodler that we saw in a Red Wings jersey before he got here. Would you agree? Actually, I'm thinking that he's probably playing his best hockey of his career as a flame and he's looked like a true first line player where he never really clicked at that level in Detroit see but I think they had guys on the depth chart above him where he was never going to get that role there true but he's showing that he's a legitimate first line guy and yeah. he's had a great week it, if it wasn't for him uh, the flames wouldn't have had seven of the eight points this week yeah no it's true and i mean hoodler is he was brought in and he's paid to be a first liner and i think just like everyone else we're getting a great season out of him he seems to be reinvigorated here so good to see and i hope we see this continue Throughout this season, if we get to the postseason, we're going to need his leadership and guidance both on and off the ice, and hopefully we'll also see it next year again. Now, I have a question for sure. you. Uh, his contract is up after next season. Do you sign him, and for how much? What's he making right now? $4 million. I think I would re-sign him at this point. I was going to say it'll depend on what he does next year, but I think he has shown enough consistency to stick around. Um, I'd re-sign him. I'd pay him the same. I wouldn't give him a long-term deal. I'd do maybe two or three years because we don't really know where the team is going um, in you know more than that. But I think that he's definitely a guy that I would want to keep here as, as a veteran presence during the rebuild. Yeah, I would probably go as long as four years, and I'd probably the max dollars would be about six. Yeah, he's 30. He's younger than I thought he was. I thought he'd be older than that. But yeah, if he's 30, that means he'll be 31 next year. Yeah, I think he could probably go five years would be the maximum. I'd like to do a four-year deal. I think that would be probably, you know, keep him here until he's past his prime, which is what we'd want. And with the Flames having... See, we don't know where the cap's going to be next year. That's the only thing in the year after. But with the cap room they have now, there'd be no problem doing six. I think you could probably sign him four years for about $5 million. Yeah, somewhat along the same lines as the Camilleri contract, plus or minus a bit. I mean, right now, if you look at the cap, he's making as much as David Jones is. So if we're able to clear Dave Jones off the books, then yeah, it makes sense that Hoodler is one of the highest paid guys in the team, which right now, as far as forwards, he's one of the highest paid by quite a bit. And that makes sense. He's one of the best forwards. Um, but yeah, I think you could definitely keep him around at five, maybe five and a half. I don't know if I'd go to six though. Yeah, that would pretty much be my cap though. I, I don't see spending like six and a half, seven no. or anything like that's too much. Well, if you look at the guys that are making six and a half, seven, they're having much better production than Hoodler is too. Yeah. That's why I like five to six, somewhere in there. And we got to be careful too, because we don't want, yeah, we don't want to pay him six million and have him a contract that we want people to take off our hands and may be this bad contract when he's thirty three, thirty four. So, yeah, I think, I think you could probably get him about five million at four years, and I think that would be a deal that we won't come back to, um, we that we won't come to regret later. I'm just looking at the at the Ford roster here. Really, there's only. Couple guys make any more than two million. We've got uh, Hoodler at four, Dave Jones at four, Mason Raymond at three point one five million, 
Stajan's making 3.6, and those are the only guys that are even close to, like, oh, the next is Backland at 1.5. So we got a fairly cheap team this year. Well, that's the reason why the Flames have the lowest payroll. It's true. The only guy on the team making more than Yari Hoodler is uh, Hiller and Weidman. So, yeah, no, I think I think if Weidman's making five and he'll be making six in his last year of this deal, there's no reason that Hoodler couldn't be making five and a half or six. No. Oh. So, yeah, that, that totally makes sense to me. Um, but yeah, I think he's got he's got the chance to be a first line winger here that he didn't get in Detroit. I think if you look at Detroit, they had their top three, top four. I don't think Hoodler was ever gonna get that shot there. So Matt, we're down to the final sixteen games of the season. Can you believe it? Time flies when you're having fun. And it has been such a fun year. Like I remember last year just being miserable at this time of the season, just grumpy and upset the flames couldn't win and this year it's been such a fun season to watch well actually where we are now we've actually tied the point total for all of last year and we have 16 games to go that's pretty good and i mean last year there's no way we were talking about postseason at any point much less this point Oh, no. (laughs) We were done pretty much right off the bat. So the fact that the Flames are in a playoff spot at the moment and are going to be pushing the rest of the way, it's phenomenal. I think last year this time we are already starting to talk about who we wanted the Flames to take in the draft. Yeah, we were. And it was like, okay, can we win the draft lottery and get Ekblad or... And if, and if we if don't we win, had a who forward, do we get? yeah, like are we gonna get Bennett or Reinhardt Dray or Dre Sadel, yeah, or Dow Colley or Ellers or a whole bunch of different guys? So, yeah. but at least now we're focusing on a playoff spot, and after that we'll be discussing which defensemen that the Flames would we'd like them to take and. All that kind of fun. So I I ran some numbers yesterday, which was March 9th. So these might be slightly outdated by the time everyone hears this show. But as of yesterday, um, the 16 games the Flames have remaining, there's nine games that are against teams that were not in a playoff spot as of midday March 9th, and seven games against teams that do have the do hold a playoff spot. So if you look at the roster, or not the roster, if you look at the schedule as it breaks down from this point, um, do you think that the Flames have an easier schedule in March and April than they say did in in uh, February? Definitely. And if you look at the teams that we're battling with, only Vancouver has an equally easy schedule. Minnesota, they play basically all the top teams the rest of the way. LA, they have a really tough schedule. Winnipeg has a really tough schedule. So the Flames are lucky in that they do play a bunch of games against teams that are on the outside currently. Whether or not the Flames actually do well against those teams is yet to be seen, but I would rather go up against the teams that are not in a playoff spot than going up against the Nashvilles, the St. Louis Blues, the Anaheim Ducks repeatedly. Like Minnesota, their schedule is a bear. I think they only play two or three games the rest of the way that against teams that are out. Yeah. Yeah, that that sounds like we definitely have an easier schedule then. And, I mean, it, you know, if you look at the schedule, the nice thing is we have our long road stretch done. And I think if anything was going to kill us, it would have been that road stretch. Um, you know, we don't play another more than one, more than two road games away in a row until the 27th of this month when we go on the road for three games. So we're pretty much home until then. And I think if we can rack up points to the Dome, we're going to be in good shape. What do you think? Yeah, well, last month, uh, at the beginning of last month, I said that if the Flames were even 500 throughout that month, that it would be a successful month. And they did finish a point ahead of that. And thus far this month, they're 3-0-1. So if the Flames can continue on a roll, especially like if they don't do well against Anaheim tomorrow or the Blues early next week, but can get points against the Leafs, the Avalanche twice, 
the Stars twice, the Flyers, the Blue Jackets, then they'll be in a good position. It, who knows, though? It, well, yeah, every I game, th- it, it, any team can beat any other team. Unless you're Edmonton, but... <laughs> We've even seen Edmonton have some surprising wins this year. True. But, you know, and I agree with you about some of those games. I think we're going to struggle against the Ducks. I think we might struggle against the Kings, or not the Kings, the uh, St. Louis Blues. But if I look at this schedule, too, the thing I like about it is there's a lot of rest time for the Flames. I mean, you know, they're not playing until Wednesday. Then they get a day off. They go on the road for two. Then they get a couple days off. Like, they're not playing a lot of back-to-backs, and there's some rest time in there. And I think that's going to help down the stretch keep guys... um, from getting hurt, from having to play it too much. So I think that, I don't know how the other teams look, but I think we have a fairly easy schedule in terms of where the games are played and how much time we have between them. And that might work in our favor too. One of those intangibles. Yeah. And uh, with having a largely home stretch from the 11th right through the 25th with only the one road game they don't have to go and travel 7,000 kilometers or whatever it was on the road so that will help in addition yeah so hopefully they can string together some wins it, it, the one good thing is that everything, their playoff lives are in firmly in their hands. They don't need to rely on other teams to lose in order to possibly get in like in years past. Like I'm, you know, the Ginley years when we were just on the outside looking in. So they control their own destiny. And if they want to get a playoff spot all they have to do is win the games yeah no i think that's a good point is you know one of my worries coming out of this road trip was that we were going to have to rely on other teams to be losing in order to get a spot or keep a spot and yeah i think the fact that the flames are now not even in a wild card as of right now when we record this on tuesday night the flames are currently sitting in number three in their division so they are in there, and it's as you said, it's theirs to lose. And we know that this team has desire and passion. I think that might be what keeps them in there. Yeah, and like looking at the out of town scoreboard right now, L.A. and uh, Minnesota are well on their way to victory, and Winnipeg's only trailing St. Louis by a single goal. So they're they're not exactly getting help on the out of town scoreboard, but it. It's up to them to win. Mm -hmm. If they win tomorrow, L.A. beating Colorado tonight doesn't matter. Or Winnipeg, if they come back, it doesn't matter. So they just have to go out and win. Period. Yeah, I think if they're going to lose at this point, they can't blame it on the schedule. I think in order for the Flames not to make the playoffs right now, they're going to have to really fall apart. Yeah, and that could happen. It could. Uh, you know, Giordano being out, you can't be playing Brody, Weidman, and Russell for 30 minutes a night for a month and a half. So, you know, and not expect them to get fatigued at the end. We'll see. Uh, but it it's a lot easier of a schedule than if they had to play nothing but the stars or you know what I mean? The ducks, all the good teams. And we play from a position of strength. We're not trying to fight our way back in, which always helps. Yeah. I really think that coming off three wins in a row and then a great comeback against Ottawa on the road trip is going to help with the momentum too. I think that if we stunk up the New York road trip and they were coming back with two, three losses, it would be hard to get back into that winning cycle too. But I think coming off, you know, the win in Philly, the win in Boston, the back-to-back win in Detroit, and then even though they lost, it was an overtime loss to uh, Ottawa, I think that's probably going to really help the momentum too. Yeah, and if you look at Anaheim, they've lost their last two games. So hopefully the Flames can take advantage of that. For sure. Well, Matt, if there's nothing else you want to chat about, why don't we jump right into that and start looking at uh, the week ahead and how we think the Flames are going to do. Sure. Sounds Um, like a plan. 
we chatted last Monday. Now, we had a little bit of audio problems, so people didn't get your predictions for last week. But last week, you predicted the Flames were going to do two points. Yeah, I didn't have faith that they would be able to overcome the 10-year drought in Boston. And we usually suck against the Flyers, so for them to win both, I was kind of surprised. And I thought the Flames would do four points, and our guest, uh, Mike Crosby, thought four points. So this, the Flames actually took uh, six points. Six seven. Seven. Oh, seven. right, se- seven points. Yeah, that's right, because they got the shootout. Um, so seven of a possible eight points this last week, which is a fantastic road week. So we both lost. Uh, that keeps the total so far at 4-1 in favor of me for the season. So... Um, this week we've got a, a bit of a tougher schedule. Well, I guess it depends how you look at it. We're back home, which is great. We play the Ducks tomorrow night on Wednesday. Then the Maple Leafs come to town. And the night after on Saturday, we go to Colorado. So three games, six points on the table. What are your predictions? I think they'll get four. Four. Yeah, I think they'll beat both Toronto and Colorado. I don't know that they have a, quite enough in them to beat the Ducks. All right. I was I was going to say four. I'm going to say five. I think that we can get a point against the Ducks um, coming off the, the road victories. I think we'll get a point against the Ducks, and I think we win both back-to-back games. So I'm going to go with five. Um, I think this is the first time we've had an an odd numbered prediction all year. Let me just check. Yep, since we've been keeping track in January, this is the first odd numbered prediction. Oh no, sorry. I thought they'd get one point on January twentieth. So um second odd numbered prediction, but I'm gonna go with five. So yeah, we'll we'll see how they do. Either way, four or five, either one would be good with me. If we can get, you know, four of six points, that's still a fantastic week. Yeah, I'm curious to see how Kari Ramo does against the Ducks. He hasn't played against them this season, and Hiller struggled, and Ordeo struggled, so we'll has, see. Has Hartley announced that he, that uh, yeah. Ramo will be in net? Yes, he has. You know, I, I like the whole ability of being able to put the stronger goalie in. We really don't have a backup, and you and I have discussed that all year. We really don't have one backup or a set, you know a starter and a backup it's just whoever's hot plays yeah and Ramo he didn't play badly against Ottawa despite giving up the four goals if you look at the goals I no goalie was going to stop any of them so you know it was just unfortunate that you know four of them did get by him so it's good to see that the coach says that you know you're going back in Gives some some confidence that you know you had a bad game because of the, just circumstances. Really, it wasn't his fault for the four goals. And if he stinks against Anaheim, it's not like we were likely going to beat them anyway because we just suck against the Ducks for whatever reason. So yeah, and then you go with Hiller against Toronto if Ramo does play poorly. So. It, Either way, it's not a big deal. I'm really looking forward to watching that Toronto game. Um, with the way that the wheels have fallen off the Leafs lately, I think that the Flames, they wanted to, could rack up some big points in that game. Uh, never say that. <laughs> you know, the hockey gods, they tend to, you know, if you take it easy... <laughs> well, I don't think you take it easy at all. But Oh, I just... no, but they... It has a way of working out where, like, that would be Toronto's only win of the last handful of games. You know how it goes. Yeah, no, you're right, I do. But it'll be it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, I'm hoping that the Flames can skunk them. Because, yeah. you know, Toronto, they are a terrible, terrible organization. So, right up there with Edmonton. There's another team that needs to do a rebuild and hopefully will do it better than Edmonton. Yeah, well, hopefully that they decide to sell off guys like Kessel, Phaneuf, Bernier, and do a complete teardown and do it properly, sort of like what Calgary has done. Well, and that's it. I think almost our blueprint for our rebuild. I mean, this year we got lucky for sure, but I think the way that Calgary's been working with their assets probably becomes the new blueprint for a rebuild. 
Yeah, get as many draft picks as possible, make sure your scouts are doing good, and select as many high-quality players as you can. Well, I think even moving out those vets, you know, like we had no shame in moving guys out who, you know, like Jerome, even if they were fan favorites, we said let them go. And I think sometimes that's the hard thing to do uh, when you're in a rebuild. Well, that's the thing. Like, if it isn't working, you have to do the hard thing and be resolute to do the hard thing. Nobody liked trading Aginla or Bo Meester or letting Kipper go to retirement, but it, you know, it is what it is. And just because it might suck today doesn't mean that's going to suck in perpetuity unless you're Edmonton. Yeah. No, it's very but, true. But, you know, Edmonton, that's a special case because of the fact that their management seems to have no clue at what they're doing or any accountability <laughs> yeah no and and i think that shanahan is probably one of the right people to be leading uh toronto through a rebuild yeah true and uh, they have been successful with some of their draft picks recently like morgan riley is a very good defenseman so hopefully they can figure it out and get a whole huge quantity of draft picks and such and restock the cupboards you know like i i would like toronto to win a cup before the year 2100 i don't know if it's gonna happen but <laughs> yeah no it's we'll, we'll see <laughs> um i i think it's funny though that you know toronto who's not made the playoffs for so many years is finally in that point of okay it's just time to blow it up well, they did a couple years ago, and then they lost in exceptional fashion <laughs> in Game 7 against Boston. But, yeah, they really need to turf everybody and just tear down right to the bones, bare bones and start over. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, I think they've done it right by changing their office somewhat. I mean, they didn't, you know, get rid of Nonis, but they've put the right hockey people in place. A lot of, just like Calgary did here, before doing the rebuild, they put in a new office team, and I think that helped us. And that's one of the things we haven't seen from Edmonton. No, and you, if you're having difficulties, you need to be able to tear it down all the way and have new people in charge to build it back up and like the flames under feaster they were able to somewhat use him as a scapegoat by allowing him to trade off everybody and blow the team up and blame him for basically for blowing the team up and allow all the pieces that were acquired to develop and allow brad for living to take over and move on forward edmonton though keeps the same people in charge every time and they wonder why they can't figure out how to fix things because they don't have a new voice in the room at all yep i know and you know like they trade off peron and petri who are two of their best players and they get draft picks for them and nothing else and how how are you gonna win with that like now you have a hole where you need another top six forward another top four defenseman and you have no resources to go out and acquire that <laughs> you know like draft picks are good but they need nhl talent and yeah i for some reason i think edmonton will actually be worse next year than they were even this year if we've, that's possible we've talked a lot about the downfall of the oilers and i guess it'll be you know it'll be an interesting story to follow over the summer of what they end up doing with those draft picks yeah man uh that's just such a bad situation overall yeah but you know we can just be happy that's not us yeah and by the way edmonton was officially eliminated from the playoffs surprise surprise for the ninth straight year and are only ahead of the buffalo sabers so i'm hoping that when the trade or draft lottery happens that a team that's below edmonton wins it so that way they do not get mcdavid or eichel 
and have to settle for either one of the smaller centers or Hannafin, which, you know, not a bad consolation prize. By they any need stretch, the defenseman. But, that might be the best thing for them. Yeah. I just don't want to see McDavid or Eichel go there because of the fact that they're actually good and I'd like them to succeed in the NHL, which that won't happen if they get drafted by Edmonton. Yeah. I'm well, just Matt, so annoyed and pissed off with Edmonton, so don't mind me. <laughs> well, let's let's enjoy the week of Flames hockey then, and not worry about the Oilers. Yeah, true they're, enough. They're out. Don't worry about them. Go go enjoy this week of Flames games. Yeah, and I am looking forward to Calgary winning at least a couple of games this week, and hopefully they can push forward for a playoff spot this year. For sure. Get to rub. Edmonton's nose in it a little bit. If that's what you want to do, then that's what you can do. I just yeah. want them in there to see <laughs> postseason hockey. I don't really care about the Oilers True. at this point. Yeah. All right, well, we'll talk to you later, Matt. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah, have a good week, everybody, and take care. Thanks for listening. Talk to you later. Go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.